Okay, so, uh, well, time frequency, localizing things in time and in frequency is something that we've all uh, seen many times before, as you see in these slides. Uh, why is it, might it even be surprising that you would want to localize in time and in frequency at the same time, since we know how to do it? Because when people, technical people, think of uh, 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 signals that depend on time, so we, I'm, I'm going to talk a lot about functions that depend on time, and uh, here t uh, generally varies uh, either over an interval or all of r. Um, when you think of a frequency, we, our automatic reflex is to think Fourier analysis, and then uh, you think of, of defining the Fourier transform. If you are in an interval, you do Fourier series, but if t is an r, then you define the Fourier transform, and uh, which I like to normalize as uh, as follows. You have to put your two pi somewhere, and this is where I put them. Uh, so we think, and uh, for instance in quantum mechanics, where uh, typically the variable is three-dimensional, and you then do a three-dimensional Fourier transform, you think of, of uh, uh, time and frequency as two sides of one coin. You're either in time, or you look at the Fourier transform and you're in frequency. In quantum mechanics, you would think of it as position and momentum. But you do want, in many applications, like these, uh, this sheet music, to have information about what happens in frequency, but locally in time. I mean, for a, uh, sheet music tells a musician which notes to play when. I mean, so notes has frequency information and when. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, many applications from different walks of life in which you do want to indeed have this frequency information, but locally in time. And for that, you need to do something beyond just the Fourier transform, because you want to keep these two aspects in there. And um, Okay, I have, yes. Uh, so here actually are two examples, I mean, of, of a time frequency uh, representation that uh, uh, we will look at. Both of them are uh, spoken uh, word signals. In the bottom part, uh, so the color uh, things here are, oops, yes, this color thing is a spectrogram and we'll, we'll come back to that. Here you have another spectrogram and uh, uh, at the bottom part we, we have just a very short bit of speech and you actually see the time signal here. Here the signal is already uh, a full second long and so uh, if you were to plot this it would become much, much more dense. Um, and you see we have these, these places where you have something happening in time and time is horizontal here, frequency vertical, and, and, and at some places you have a wide frequency range at some very narrow one. Let's look at another example here again. I mean, here you actually see uh, how, how, how dense the signal, how fast it oscillates for a speech signal. Here actually we have a music instrument, so we get closer to, to sheet music. And in fact, there are even applications where people have looked at, at uh, 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 the music the st and, and recognized the score in the representation in the spectrogram. And you can find online uh, software that will try to annotate music from a spectrogram. So just this as an introduction to talk about, uh, to, to situate this idea of time frequency localization. And, um, Oops, oops, I'll try to, to not, not work too much with the microphone. Uh, not, not to disturb the microphone too much. So uh, what we are going to do in order to... Uh, uh, that was the extent of the slides. 
So we could extinguish the projector if somebody is up there who can perform such magic. Um, what we want to do is, uh, well, it's very simple. If I have my function in time, then I can try to localize it first by just cutting out a piece of it. So my function in time is, is, is something that varies. I mean, and it oscillates much faster than that, as you've seen in, in the real signals, but I can't draw uh, like that. What we're going to do is we're going to, we could cut little pieces from it. And then for this short piece, compute a Fourier series. And then we could look at the next piece, and for this, compute its Fourier series again. And since we only, only are looking at little pieces, we will have kind of localized the function and then looked at the... So what that amounts to is that we are uh, taking our function, we're uh, going to multiply it by some window, I mean, let's take this. Oh, well, let's take it. Let's use a different one than this long interval tau uh, t. And uh, we're going to move this at different locations. So this will tell us where we put ourselves in time. I mean, here or there or there and so on. And then we'll compute a Fourier series of each of these. Um, uh, and I'll put an N here. Okay, so by now I, I got it more or less right. Um, and uh, so... You don't put uh, 2 pi, it's the root of 2 pi for the... Yeah, I am going to put it in. I was wondering, should I do it? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, then, uh, so these are Fourier coefficients. So let's call them, uh, um, so this is a transform of my function. Uh, and. I have coefficients m, n. Okay, so that will give me indeed a, a family depending on two indices. I could also, if I wanted to do it continuously, I mean, and I'll do both of these during uh, 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 the, the, the lectures that we will see. I could also define a, uh, uh, well, let's, let's first do it this way, discreetly. Uh, if I do that, I mean, I immediately am going to amend this. If I do that, then even though my function typically is nice and continuous, all the ones you've seen, uh, even though it's speech that starts and stops and so on, the time signal, in fact, is nice and continuous. I have introduced discontinuities. I mean, well, I've introduced discontinuities because I, I uh, as far as the Fourier series are concerned, uh, when you truncate like this, you are doing the same as expanding a function that repeats periodically. And because the truncation here typically is not at the same value, the function has not obtained the same value as it had there, you have implicitly introduced the discontinuity there. And that is something for which you pay a price. Discontinuous of, uh, of, uh, Fourier transforms of discontinuous functions decay very slowly in. So you have very slow decay in N, which you have introduced with your tool. In fact, a whole lot of what we will see I mean, even uh, things in the spectrogram, I should have pointed it out when we, we saw the figure, uh, they are features that you introduce in the signal because of the tool that you use to analyze it. And you want to do as little as possible of that type that is emblematic of your tool 
rather than the signal you want to analyze. The thing that we had in the spectrogram and that I forgot to point out is that we had often we had repeats in, in speech of actually it, it, we, had, we had something not very bent here and then a little bit more bent there and then even more bent there which people have even given names. I mean uh, they're the different harmonics of, but again, there's something that we have put in with our analysis tool. It's not something in the signal. The signal is not something that consists of many harmonics. These harmonics we put in there by looking at it a certain way. And I'll come back to that in uh, probably next week, maybe the week after. So we want to not do that. Well, one way in which we can avoid having these discontinuities is by not cutting things very abruptly and so by making our windows softer. And so that's the very first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to remove this abrupt thing and I'm going to put a window function here. And in fact, uh, now my window is going to be, I'm still going to translate it by a certain tau and I, uh, uh, but my window is now wider. And so you see, we start overlapping because, well, if, if, if I made my window soft and didn't overlap, then it's pretty obvious that I wouldn't have much information in my transform on, 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 on where the windows touch and are very small. Um, and so if I still thought of it in terms of Fourier series, then I could say, well, I have localized here and I would do Fourier series with respect to this wide interval. And then for the next one that I've localized here, I would do Fourier series with respect to that interval and so on. And you would then see that uh, uh, I, I, I pay for this overlap in the fact that my time and frequency localization are not as tightly wound together. We'll come back to that. That's one reason why I put in two parameters here, this tau and this omega. If, to go back to the window to Fourier transform with, with, with a sharp cutoff, if I had, if I do my sharp cutoff like I did, had done earlier, then on an interval with length tau, I would have my, the standard Fourier transform would be to just take f of t from zero to tau e to the i uh, n t uh, I would put two pi over tau and so that would co correspond to omega equals to two pi over tau, dt. And you put a minus sign always? I, yeah, my, I, I sometimes forget the minus sign and so on because it doesn't matter much. Yeah. But thank you for me making me consistent. I mean, uh, um, okay, so, uh, and, and uh, I, I would have a normalization factor in order to, well, let's think of the normalization factor. Um, 1 over tau, I would get, if I call these uh, Cn, then I would have that the, uh, the integral from 0 to tau of ft squared dt would be exactly equal to the sum over the Cn squared. Uh, no, it wouldn't be. Yeah, uh, one of the two. Yes. Um, and uh, so I would have found a nice orthonormal basis. And in fact, in, in order to make an orthonormal basis out of a, a construction like this, I can choose, I mean, I've done that here, by choosing uh, uh, this, this, this strict window and taking omega to pi over t, uh, a tau. Uh, I can do that for other windows. 
I mean, there exist other functions w for which I still will have an orthonormal basis. But you always need to have this. So if you want that the w m n of t, which are w of t minus m tau e to the i n omega t, form an orthonormal basis, then you must have that m, that omega times tau equals 1. Independently of w? Independently of? of w? Of the Independently of w. Well, a w is normalized to norm 1. So, integral of uh, w squared dt is 1. You can only have an orthonormal basis if, uh, uh, and uh, well, but we will be uh, interested in many cases where omega times uh, tau is actually smaller, as we need to do when we make our window softer. So we already are looking at situations where we make a discrete transform, but it's what physicists like to call redundant, meaning the coefficients uh, are, are uh, or, or what they also like to call overcomplete. I mean, the, the functions are overcomplete in the sense that uh, there are uh, uh, linear combinations with nicely decaying coefficients of all the basis functions, of all the, the, the building block functions that sum to zero. Um, okay, so uh, I've told you that we want to look at uh, that. I mean, orthonormal bases, of course, are very, very nice because you have uh, uh, so. This would be an orthonormal basis for L2 of R. And I have this, this, this equality on the interval from 0 tau. And then by moving my window to different m's, I would get that my, uh, uh, the integral of f of t squared, if I take my window to be uh, uh, 1 over square root tau, characteristic function of 0 tau t, that the integral over all of r would just be the sum over all the m n of the corresponding uh, coefficients m n squared. So I would have an orthonormal basis. And that's why orthonormal bases are very nice, because I can then also, if I take the inner product between functions, have these would be the CFs and the CGs. So all computations that I might want to do are extremely easy. Um, There's no support condition on W, yes. And in fact, uh, if you want an example with, with not compact support, you could think of, I mean, there is a, a symmetry in, in my transform in time and frequency. I mean, if you, uh, might be a good, a good point to say that. So, um, my, the, the way I've written my Fourier transform, it is unitary. And so uh, uh, I can view, so Tf of tau and omega, uh, Tf and n, sorry, is the inner product of, um, uh, well, I've stuck my 2 pi there, I'll, I'll have to live with it. Um, it's the inner product of f and 1 over 2 pi w minus uh, m tau e to the uh, 
So let me try, let me do it differently. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's a Fourier transform of a function. And the function is f w minus m tau. And I have Fourier transformed that and looked at it in uh, the argument n omega. But I can also write that integral by writing the integral for the Fourier transform, since the Fourier transform is unitary. And so I can also write it as 1 over square root 2 pi integral over xi of f hat xi. And then I have to Fourier transform the remainder. So Fourier transforming w t minus m tau e to the minus i and t. If I Fourier transform that e to the minus i xi t dt 1 over square root 2 pi, then I will get, uh, by change of variables, you see that, uh, so I have to add that again. You see that I get e to the uh, minus i and m uh, tau and e to the minus, uh, so there's no tau, uh, I had an omega here, didn't I? Yes, omega, tau omega. And then I had e to the minus uh, i xi m tau, the Fourier transform of w hat in uh, xi plus n omega, and that's it. So if, as I said, omega tau is 2 pi, this becomes 2 pi, and so this doesn't contribute. And so I have the Fourier transform here is w hat of xi plus n omega e to the minus i xi m tau. So I get exactly the same kind of expression, but where I have f hat, I have a window w hat. The translation now is by, well, the n and m's vary over all of z, so it doesn't matter that I have here plus n and m. Could you say translation is by minus omega? So the role of f is taken by f hat. The window is taken by the omega hat, a uh, w hat. Uh, uh, n and m have changed roles, so omega has become tau, tau has become omega, and n and m have changed roles. Minus n and m. And so since we could build an orthonormal basis by taking a rectangular window in time, we can build an orthonormal basis by taking a rectangular window here in frequency, which in, in time would have an infinite support. So you don't need finite support. And actually, there was a Danish group that tried to build a, a function that, that, that did the best in both worlds, that had some decay in, 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 uh, in, in, in time and in frequency, and infinite support on both sides. Um, however, you cannot build a very, very nice orthonormal basis that way. I mean, we would love to have orthonormal basis because we, we like, uh, we always like the solution of easiness. I mean, well, that's been my experience that whenever you can get away with something easy in, in, in you try to do it. Computationally it really helps, it makes for faster algorithms. But uh, uh, so it would love to, to, to have an orthonormal basis, but it turns out you can't make 
uh, you can't choose a window that is very soft in time and very soft and that have good decay in frequency and that will give you an orthonormal basis. And that's an argument that was uh, 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 that's proposed independently by uh, two physicists, Ballion and Law, Francis Law, and uh, they. Oh, sorry, Law, Francis Law. Um, and it's actually a, a, a pretty argument, and and uh, well, there are various ways of, see of seeing it, but it will also introduce a tool that will be useful for us. So um, let's let's see. So there are no orthonormal bases of windowed Fourier transforms. for which uh, uh, W and W hat are both smooth with fast decay. Okay, so to see that, well, it actually, I, I, I'm vague, but I mean, it's already sufficient for them to, to uh, uh, decay faster than 1 over t, or 1 over xi. <coughs> okay, so... Um, How shall we do this? First of all, I'm looking at a situation where omega times tau is 2 pi. So let's take tau equals 1. By scaling, I can always reduce myself to the case where uh, tau is 1 and omega is 2 pi. So I'm looking at functions, my WMNs of t are just functions that I translate by integers and that are modulated by e to 2 pi n t. And I'm going to introduce a, a transform. Uh, I'm going to show that those can never be if w and w hat uh, uh, decay. Uh, reasonably, I'm going to show that these cannot form an orthonormal basis by reasoning via a transform, uh, a unitary transform that uh, has been proposed by many people, but uh, uh, in particular by a physicist called uh, Joshua Zak. And so, uh, since that's the shortest name of all the people who've proposed it, I mean, let's call it the Zak transform. So uh, this is a transform that goes from L2 of R to L2 of 0, 1 squared. So L2 of the unit square. It will be unitary. And that will do something very nice to our functions, which will make it then easy to see that they cannot be uh, 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 that the original W cannot decay fast in both time and frequency. Okay, so the first thing I do is if I take a function, any function uh, uh, g, I define it, I define a function of two variables s and t as the, uh, I take the sum over all l and z, of g s minus l, and I put here e to 2 pi i t l. So what I'm doing in this transform is I'm s here, I'm in 0, 1, s and t are in 0, 1. So s in, in l equals 0, I carve out a piece between 0 and 1, and I uh, 
in T, I, in a certain sense, put it at, at, at the L equals zero. So in, in, in T, I, I'm thinking of Fourier series and I'm stacking different pieces of G in different layers. So that's what this transform is doing. Uh, I claim, I mean, and we'll now see, that this is a, a unitary transform. Already, you should note, I, I will think of these functions here in two ways. I will think of this um, as functions that living on zero, one, and that is where I have it unitary. But I also will think of, once I have this form of the functions, of, of them as just like you do with Fourier series. You think of it as an interval, but you can also view it as the periodic extension of that function, of which you are then looking at properties. I can also look at an extension here, and let me do that already now. It's clear that if you take the Zach transform of a function and you were to choose to plug in in this formula that I have here, t plus 1 instead of t. So I'm trying to periodize it in t. Then that, of course, doesn't make any change because l is integer. And so I can uh, also view these functions as being completely periodic in t. In, in l, it's a bit more, in, in s, it's a bit more complicated. Because if I put an n, an, a plus 1 in t, the natural thing, if we look at our formula, is we have here g s plus 1 minus l e to the 2 pi i t l. The natural thing is to absorb, so if I, if I make this minus k, so k is l minus 1, then this becomes here k plus 1. And so I get that the natural, if I want to do this extension, then in order to be nice and consistent, I have to introduce this phase factor, e to the 2 pi i t. So because of this funny way of stacking uh, things, I, this is, if you extend the function over the whole, the whole plane, how you should do it. Okay, so... I have a third blackboard. You have uh, also a uh, thing on the right. Yeah. Yes. You have the a pole. Two. Yeah. Uh, in between the two things. In between the two things. Ah, there is indeed a pole. Oh my, I'm going to become. This is so much fun. Okay. Wonderful. And then this. Yes. Great. Ooh. And by the end of the lectures, I will be proficient. And I, will, I should think of the best permutation to use those boards. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll continue here, which is not a continuation of there, but anyway. So, um, okay. If I, so let's now look at uz of uh, before I am going to look at uz acting on these w's, I'm going to look at uz on my very special, on, on this very special fam family of functions, which was the, the, the interval zero one. Uh, t minus m e to the 2 pi i n t. And I've argued to you before that that family of functions is an orthonormal functions in uh, an orthonormal basis in L2 of R because I'm just doing Fourier series on intervals of length one, one after the other. So this, let me call these functions E m n of t and they form an orthonormal basis. of L2 of R. Let's look at what happens to those when I apply UZ to them. 
Uh, so UZ, EMN. So I get the sum over L in Z. And I uh, take the function in argument S minus L. And then I have to multiply that by e to the 2 pi i t l. Um, my s is in between 0 and 1. If my s is in between 0 and 1, then the only contribution that I uh, here I have 0, 1. The only uh, L for which this lies between 0 and 1 is uh, m equals to minus L. So that means that my whole sum reduces to just uh, the term L equals to minus m. And I get uh, a 1 here, e to the minus 2 pi i t, L is equals to minus m, so here. Then I have e to the 2 pi i n s, and of course the l n here doesn't contribute. So this, on the other hand, we re easily recognize that this is an orthonormal basis for L2 of the square. If s and t vary between 0 and 1, we have an orthonormal basis here. So uz maps this orthonormal basis to an orthonormal basis of the square, so uz is unitary. So this is an orthonormal basis of L2 of 0, 1. Okay. Uh, UZ is a unitary map. Fine. We can see the same... Uh, um, But the computation we've done here will help us also immediately to see what happens to the WMN. If I do a W here, then all I have here is to write W S minus M minus L and I can compute that. Don't you hate it when you take notes when people do this to you? I mean <laughs> Uh, okay, so I absorb, what I'm going to do is to make a change of variables, of course. I mean, so first I can forget the L here, because that's already true. The e to the 2 pi i and s I can take outside. And then here I'll call this, so I have m plus l. I'll absorb an m in here, so in order to make that easy. I write it here. And then by changing the summation variable, I get an e to the minus 2 pi i t m here. I just have the USAC transform of W itself. OK, so I have that uh, my, so I started. with the WMNs, and I wanted to them to be an orthonormal basis. That means that the UZ WMNs should be an orthonormal basis for L2 of 0, 1 squared, which is the same as uh, a space of functions that have this weird periodicity and for which I compute the norm by just integrating on the square. So the uh, kind of twisted doubly periodic functions on R2.
Okay, these are just the multiplication by e to the 2 pi i n s, e to the minus 2 pi i t n of, let's call that uh, a function w s t, the Zach transform of the function itself. Now, for this to be an orthonormal basis on L2 of 0, 1 squared, there's a simple, easy, uh, necessary, sufficient condition, namely that this has absolute value 1. So, this is, means that W S T is 1 for S and T in 0, 1. But that means also that uh, since, since the, the uh, twisted doublet periodic extension doesn't change the magnitude, I mean it only gives you phase factors, that it has to be that for all S and T in R. Sorry, why is it supposed to be evident, the value of the response? Oh, because uh, uh, what I want is uh, uh, F, um, uz w m n sum over this square should be equal to the integral of f t s t squared over the square. But this is the sum over m and n of the integral over the square of f s t and then w s t conjugate e to the minus 2 pi i and s e to the 2 pi i t n ds dt squared but since these are an orthonormal basis on L2 of the square, I get that this is the, uh, so I have a sum of the expansion with respect to an orthonormal basis, so I get that this is F S T squared times W S T squared the s dt and for this to be equal to the integral of f squared I will need that this is equal to 1 almost everywhere. Uh, because I am going to assume the formula I gave here for the transform okay Strictly speaking, this formula, I can only define it for, for functions g that have good decay. I mean, you were very kind in not pushing my nose into that when I wrote it. But, uh, so let's do it for only those functions that have good decay. Then, I, once I had proven it for an orthonormal basis, that I mapped an orthonormal basis to an orthonormal basis, I have a unitary map on a, a, a dense set and so I can extend to the full space. Okay, if my, W's, if my W function has decay faster than one over T, then this series is going to be absolutely convergent and I can just define it. If G decays faster than one over L, uh, one over T, then I have a decay faster than one over L and it's absolutely convergent. If the Fourier transform has a similar property, then the function itself will be continuous and you can prove that, the Fourier, that, that this Zach transform is going to be nice and continuous. And if you have more decay, you will have differentiability. But let's go for continuity. I'm going to assume, so <coughs> I have to, so orthonormal basis gives me that W has to be one. And I'm going to assume W and W hat decay faster than 1 over T or 1 over Xi, respectively. 
And so I'm going to have that W is continuous. And then it turns out that these two are not compatible. And that's what we'll do next. And Okay, so, and for that I'm going to use the fact that I know that Ws t plus 1 has to be, if I extend the function, and that Ws plus 1 t has to be W of s t times e to the 2 pi i t. And I'll do it in a very pedestrian way, uh, show that this is incompatibility, that this is incompatible with W equals 1 and continuity. But I could also invoke uh, uh, a nice topological. In, in, in it. What's really happening is that I'm, I'm making a topological argument about, uh, but let's do it in a pedestrian way. Um, okay, so W can be written as T as E to the, let's say, 2 pi i phi S T, where phi S T is real. This tells us that phi of S t plus 1 has to be up to an integer phi of st. So there is some integer this tells us that phi of s plus 1 t is equal to phi of s t plus t plus some integer lst. So let's now look at phi of s plus 1 t plus 1. And I can get from here to st in two possible ways. I can write it as phi s plus 1 t plus the k of s t plus 1. Uh, is that uh, uh, s plus 1 t? Sorry. And that gives me phi s t plus t plus k s plus 1 t plus l s t. But I can also say that this is phi of s t plus 1 plus then the argument t plus 1 plus l s t plus 1. And that I can then here continue. I get phi st plus st plus on the k st plus all the other stuff that I had. And so you see 
that since all these things are equal, that I get that k s plus 1 t plus l s t is equal to 1 plus k s t plus l s t plus 1. But since w is continuous, phi is continuous. Phi being continuous means that the k and l have to be continuous. Since they're integers, they're going to be constants. It's the only way. So I get here k plus <coughs> l equals 1 plus k plus l, which is a contradiction. And in fact, I didn't even need that w is 1. In fact, I mean, in my case, I already had w is 1, but if I take any other Zach transform of a function, so something that has this kind of twisted double periodicity. And if I assume, so if I take here some f on the Zach transform side, and if I assume that double, that this is bigger than some constant bigger than zero, and is continuous, then I can always look at the function f divided by capital by its absolute value. And that will be continuous because of this condition. And I can then repeat the same argument. So it is just impossible for a function that is the Zach transform of, of an, a, a nice function, so that this, the, this Zach transform function is continuous itself, to be always non-zero, to not have a zero. And that's what we've done. So there, this is the argument of Balian Lo, that there exists no uh, uh, function that, that has reasonable decay, decay faster than 1 over t or 1 over xi, and 1 over xi, and that will give you an orthonormal basis. And so when I was talking earlier about this, this uh, construction that had been done by a Danish group of a window that tried to do the optimal thing, what they did is they just skirted that. I mean, they had decay like 1 over t and 1 over xi, but not better. I mean, because you can't do better. Um, So, it turns out that, I mean, so for a long time, that was where uh, things stood with respect to this kind of time frequency representation and trying to make orthonormal basis. And it was an excellent motivation to look at, uh, 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 to look at, at uh, representations in which we would take uh, a window function and translate and And since we want a window function that is well concentrated and smooth, so typically the type of function for which the Zach transform would be continuous, we cannot have an orthonormal basis. So uh, what we typically will do is W uh, reasonably smooth and concentrated. And so, orthonormal basis impossible. And that gets expressed by the fact that we typically take tau times omega less than 2 pi. And I'll, I'll come back on, I mean, we'll, we'll be using this and, use it and, and looking at properties of them later. But I also already want to give you a little bit an advance uh, uh, notice of something else that we will do. 
Although it turns out that you can't make an orthonormal basis this way, it, 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 it uh, became apparent in the 1990s that in fact if you go contrary to our, all our impulses uh, of, of, uh, that we, 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 we learn when we, when we, as an undergraduate or, or as a high school student, learn first about complex exponentials. If contrary to all those impulses, we wanted to stick with sines and cosines rather than with complex exponentials. So if you try to do, so work instead of e to the i uh, something uh, xi t with sine xi t and cosine xi t, you can in fact build orthonormal basis. So just by looking at these and 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 uh, so you can find very nice window functions for which you still get an orthonormal basis. And it turns out those are useful. And uh, uh, they, they, uh, this was a construction that uh, originally was done by uh, Stéphane Jaffard, Jean Lajournée, and myself. And we we built them, uh, I insisted that we build examples that were based on starting with a W that was had a, a, a Gaussian profile and we had to take certain combinations and we found combinations that had exponential decay. Uh, I liked taking Gaussian uh, functions because I knew that people in uh, molecular and atomic physics love working with Gaussians because it means you never have to compute the integral explicitly because all those Gaussian integrals you know what they give and so you have very fast algorithms to compute things with. And so although we, we built them and I, I peddled them for some years to people who were doing computations in atom atomic and molecular physics and some of them used them, they did not become widespread. But then it turned out in a completely different physical application in the search for gravitational waves that it was very, very useful to have things of that nature. And they did play a role in, in the LIGO detection of gravitational waves. So out of a completely different physical angle, they, 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 they turned out to be useful. Should so be, uh, Ken Wilson cited? Yes, so this was based, I mean, and, and but I just wanted to give a an, 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 an intro to it. I mean, we'll come back to them later. I mean, and not today. Uh, this construction here was based on an observation by Ken Wilson. Um, who had pointed out that in many opportunities, yes, he says, if you want to, book or to, to localize in time and frequency, you want to look at things that shift in time and shift in frequency, yes. But he says often in physics, you don't want to actually localize in frequency, you want to localize in frequency squared because it, it has to do with energy and, 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 and energy is, is a function of frequency or momentum squared. He was thinking quantum mechanics, so momentum squared. And he said then working with, I mean, the difference between, if you think in, 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 on, the, on the Fourier side, uh, an exponential localizes, I mean, if, if I take, uh, okay, so let me backtrack. If I take my function w, and I move it around. Uh, yeah, m tau. And I move it around here to pi i m omega t. We've seen that in Fourier that amounts to taking omega hat xi uh, plus n omega and e to the minus 2 pi i. Uh, well, e to the, I have no 2 pi here. Oh, shoot. 
then I have here 2 pi n omega and here I have e to the minus uh, uh, i m tau xi. So if, if you want to localize in, if I think now, like those spectrogram pictures that I showed you in time and frequency, I want to be nicely localized around m tau. So W is nicely localized around zero, and that means that this thing is nicely localized around m tau. And if I want to be localized nicely in frequency, again, I think of W hat as something that's nicely localized around zero, then I'm here at minus 2 pi i n omega. So I think of it this way. But if I don't care whether I am localized around this frequency or that frequency, then that means I don't care. I mean, I don't care whether I have here this or that. And that would give me a W plus minus. I'm here or there in frequency. And that means that I have the freedom to take cosines or sines here, which are exactly combinations of two of these. And so he said, because I want to have localization frequency squared, uh, cosines or sines are admissible. And he then did numerical constructions that showed that it, that it might be possible to well localize things. I mean, the funny thing about that paper is that it was never published. I mean, actually, I, I, I have written to uh, Ken Wilson's widow asking him for the permission to post it on the archive so that people will actually see it. Uh, but uh, I haven't heard back from her. I have to call her again to see. Um, but it is on archive. I mean, one can find it. I found it. You found it now? Yeah, I looked on the internet. I got it. Yeah. Well, it, you can find a later paper that uh, contains the construction, but it's not the original preprint. Of oh, well, this, what I got is a preprint, I mean, it's a type. Yes, okay, so you can get it from the Cornell archive. So, uh, 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 and that's, but, but I would like it to be on, 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 on archive. Yes, yes. Because uh, in order to get it from, from, from the Cornell archive, you know, have to know exactly where to, to look. Well, archive is very well searchable. And, and you can find it via Google. I did this too, and, and, and that's how I... But, uh, uh, but even the one you get from the Cornell archive is not the original preprint that jean Journé and Jaffar and I uh, used. I mean, there's an, another version that was, was prior to the unpublished paper in, in the Cornell archive. And, um, and in places where Google doesn't work, you can't find it. And there exist places in the world where Google doesn't work. So, I so, have, so I have a question because before omega tau equal two pi was an assumption. You started saying, if ah, we are looking yes. for orthonormal basis, yes, if I, it's a, a necessary condition is this, yes. then you prove under this necessary yes. condition there does not exist. Are you now right? you are changing two things. You are saying maybe the exponential two pi uh, i becomes sine cosine. And I also relax this. So no, no, what no. is the logic? No, no, no. There's, uh, okay, so I, I, I swept something under the rug in saying, I mean, you can actually prove, but I had not planned to do it in these lectures, that for an orthonormal basis, you must have omega t uh, tau if equals 2 pi. Must, okay. If you have an orthonormal basis, you must have omega tau equals 2 pi. It's but the only... Uh, and and uh, uh, But uh, if I can not get an orthonormal basis, uh, then and I do want to, to have nice constructions with smooth functions, and I do want to have an equivalence, and we'll, we'll get back to that, between the uh, L2 square of the function that I'm transforming and the coefficient, then I must take omega tau less than uh, 2 pi. Yeah, still, uh, if, if I just relax the exponential in sine and cosine, then I get an orthonormal basis? With, with omega tau equals to 2 pi, yes. You don't need to relax if you relax the idea that you want to really localize. If you allow uh, for, so in, in, in what, what it 
if, if you think in, in, in frequency, I was always thinking of things that were nicely, if I look at w hat, I want a w hat of uh, xi uh, plus n. I wanted to, to have w m n hat to be nicely localized around m xi. If I relax that it needs to be localized around m xi, it can also have a bump around minus, uh, so not m xi, around uh, m omega, around minus m omega, then I can make an orthonormal basis. With an orthonormal basis, if I just use sines and cosines, still will require that omega times tau equals 2 pi. That's one thing. And that's the one that was used for, for that's the Wilson basis idea, and that's uh, the one that for which the, the, the construction using uh, Gaussians, uh, linear combinations of Gaussians with exponential tails, uh, was used in LIGO. On the other hand, and this is a different stream, we're not trying to do orthonormal basis because in general, we do want, if you do signal analysis, you really do want to localize exactly in frequency. One reason for that is that we may want in, in, uh, uh, in, in uh, work to work with images, for instance, with, with signals that have in two dimensions. If we start localizing If we start looking at bases that in one dimension have two peaks and we take products of them, I mean, so then I'm going to have, and this is something that we do with wavelets, uh, then we're going to have localization here. And so in, in frequency, in two dimensions, we would have things that are localized on those four corners. And those correspond to completely different directions in space. And so that is something we do not want. Okay. By the way, in music, the notation would be real. No, these are sine, cosine, no? True. Yeah. And, well, Um, you look at the real things, and so yes, you have. Uh, and so, in 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 one variable. Yeah, one variable is. Uh, yes. Don't yeah. And. But the other thing is that um, in many situations, so for music, you look at the, at the sound. But. Uh, the, the sound itself, because of the way it's produced, it makes sense to view it as what's sometimes called an analytic signal. So the real part of a, a, a complex function. And as soon as you work with complex functions, looking at 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 positive and a negative frequency. I mean, even if you work with cosines and sines, you have these negative frequencies that come in, and that you have to deal with. So. Uh, there, there are a number of reasons why, for certain applications, you do want that exact localization frequency. Okay, so I, Pierre had proposed that we would uh, have a break in the middle, because otherwise it becomes very, very long. So maybe this is a natural point to have a, a, a break of 15 minutes and then resume. We had reached a, a, a natural stopping point because I had wanted to tell you about those orthonormal bases with sines and cosines, although we will do the computation at a later point. Um, but uh, so let me now go back to where we were. We were looking at uh, uh, the windowed Fourier transform. And uh, it consisted in taking a function over 
a real line and uh, looking at a, uh, uh, a window function that we multiplied with it and that we translated. And we also looked at a, uh, an, an, an exponential factor. Uh, oh, let me change my integration. I'm, I'm sorry, notation is something that I'm very fluid in, so I hope you won't mind. Uh, the, uh, Paul Halmos, who's a mathematician who wrote a number of books, gave the advice uh, that you should, in order to make your life easy, uh, adopt notations in what you did that you then stuck through your whole life so that even if you looked at old notes, you would immediately know and so on. And I thought, oh my God, this it just doesn't work for me. So I look at old notes and I never understand them. But uh, so uh, let's uh, do this and... Uh, uh, So the difference with what I was doing before was that I already discretized the translation factor and as well as the, uh, uh, so before I wrote an e to the minus i and omega uh, t because I was integrating over t, but so you should have thought of that as really an omega not a parameter that I fixed and what I was varying was n. Here, let's, oh, well, maybe let's write a new instead of. Uh, so here I'm thinking of t and omega. So I have a transform of the function f, and I look in two variables, t and nu. Um, so I'm now going to think of them continuously because that also is a point of view that can be very useful. So uh, I'm going to look at the window Fourier transform for continuous time and frequency shifts. And the earlier window Fourier transform that I was looking at, you can then think of as a kind of discretization, a sampling of this continuous transform. And all these different points of view turn out to be useful in different ways. So we're looking at similar objects, but from different angles. Okay, so if I do this, then uh, it turns out that uh, this T is going to map L2 of R to L2 of R2. So again, we'll have a, a mapping and it will have interesting properties. In fact, if we choose our window uh, such that uh, uh, it, it has L2 norm 1, then uh, up to a, uh, well, in any case, up to a constant, the whole thing will be a, uh, a unitary, uh, will, yeah, will preserve inner products and norms again. So let's, uh, let's, let's see how that works. Oops, sorry. Um, okay, so let's take Tf, T nu and t g t nu and integrate over r2 this thing. Uh, first of all, uh, if you look at this expression, as, uh, and you concentrate on the variable nu, then it looks exactly like a Fourier transform up to the square root two pi that I like to introduce. So let's just do that. Let's integrate only over nu and see what we get. Well, we have that famous two pi because I don't have the one over square root two pi in them. I have to introduce it now. 
And uh, the function of which I'm taking the Fourier transform is this. So I have that integral over nu is going to be the uh, f s w s minus t. And then I have here g s conjugate w s minus t conjugate d s over r. I've just used unitarity of the Fourier transform. Fine. I am now going to integrate also, so that was the integral over r in nu. If I add another integral in r over t, then I have integrated over uh, uh, two, over, over r2, and I have here this. And now there's something very interesting because I have, and again, all these things make sense and all the exchanges of integration, I mean I'm going to make an exchange of integration now, is, are justified if things converge absolutely. So I will, initially, uh, one should work with functions f and g. I mean my function, win my window function, I always like to take nicely decaying, so that integral is not a problem. But I will also take f and g that are sufficient in decay that the integral converges absolutely. So I have no problem and so I can then exchange integration and I prove then certain equivalences, namely I'll prove an equivalent of norm, which then extends to unitarity to arbitrary functions, the standard argument. Um, so if I exchange order of integration, then I can see that I have here an integral, I can change, I can absorb in integration over t this variable s and so I have that I find here um, to pi and then integration over s f s g s and then I have here the integral over u of w u squared and so that if I take w to be uh, of, of, of L2 norm 1 is just one and I find here that this is 2 pi, the inner product of f and g in L2 of r. And as promised, now I have equivalent of norm and I can extend to functions that are less nice. So what you find is that indeed this operation t preserves norms. It, it's not unitary. Of course, I mean, I'm going to a much too big space. Um, if, let me be a little bit more. If I write here as an index, as a subscript, the window function I chose. And if I, in, in this integral, if I were to allow myself the liberty of choosing different windows, then the computation that I've made would still work. I would here have my window <coughs> 1 and here have my window 2. And what would happen here is that I would find window 1 u, window 2 u du. And so I would find here the inner product of w1 and w2 in L2 of r. And so that already, what happens is that I get something very nice. The TWs map a little L2, an L2 space of one dimension to L2 of R2. And I have I have for different windows, if I have orthogonal windows, I find, well, it's not this way, it's, it's Orthogonal windows map to orthogonal subspaces because if W1 is orthogonal to W2, then this inner product becomes zero and you have orthogonality. So you, you have this very nice mapping of, of, of this space into, uh, in fact, if you 
take a collection of W's that form themselves an orthonormal basis in L2 of R, then the collection of their images will span L2 of R2. You can prove that, I won't go into that. But you have this, this very nice way of mapping uh, uh, L2 of R into this, this whole fan of, of, uh, of, of subspaces of L2 of R2. All of them in, in, in a way that's non-preserving, in a product preserving. Um, you might say, well, when am I ever going to have windows that are orthogonal to each other? Uh, I mean, because I'm thinking of them as rounded off uh, 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 window functions. Now, I might round off a window function differently. I might, I might make it a little steeper or a little softer or so on. None of those functions are ever going to be orthogonal. Well, yes and no. Of course, those are never going to be orthogonal. But it actually makes sense to want to look at orthogonal windows. And this has been done, uh, has been put into practice by uh, uh, engineers. There is... Uh, 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 something that's called multi-tapered windowing. Uh, which has been, uh, uh, which is used, which was proposed by David Thompson, who was then at Bell Labs. He's now, I think at, uh, uh, at the University in Canada, and I'm not sure which one anymore, in Toronto, um, in which uh, he proposes the use of different windows that are in fact orthogonal. The reason is not quite this windowed Fourier transform, although it has been used in that context as well. The reason he proposed multi-tapering was that uh, the, the kind of, of problems you have with very sharp cutoffs in, in, in analysis of, 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 of data uh, happen also if you just analyze data that are sampled over a finite interval. Uh, what happens is that, uh, again, if you just you have all your samples and you, you typically compute spectra by a Fourier transform of that, that whole sequence of, of data. You have again, you're again mathematically introducing a discontinuity typically if things don't end in the same way as they started. And so it is because a one way of looking at it is like saying I have implicitly taken an infinite series <coughs> of which I only have a finite number of observations, so I implicitly have multiplied them with a window function like that. And so I am automatically am causing bad decay in the resulting Fourier series because of my windowing, because of only having finite number of observations, that, that is very, very slow because of this sharp cutoff. So the, what people do then is say we want to taper. I mean, instead of, of, of I mean, tapering means putting a, a decay here. And with my windowed Fourier transform, I said, look, we'll have overlapping windows, we'll go a little wider and so on. You can go a little wider if you have a little wider to go. And when I have lots of data that I cut into little pieces, I can do that. People who work with finite number of observations of something that they know has an, an unlimited time series, but you cannot observe for longer, they only have this many, so they can't go further. And so they have to go inside in order to taper. But then, of course, you get into big trouble with the experimentalists because they have worked very, very hard to get those observations there. And here you're saying that you're not going to give them much weight in your analysis. So, I mean, what Dave Thompson discovered is that you should taper, but you should taper with several different windows that are orthogonal. And uh, that allows you to exploit the data that you have here at the very end to maximal effect. And so he proved very beautiful uh, theorems 
showing that. And in fact, in our windowed Fourier transform world, the way we look at it, that corresponds to taking Ws that are orthogonal. The functions that he proposed are, uh, that's a, a different matter, which I have not planned to talk about, but I can, in, in these lectures, but I can answer questions during breaks if you want. So what he proposed was uh, use uh, uh, orthogonal uh, prolate Freudal functions. And uh, those happen to be uh, uh, functions that have very nice uh, localization properties in time frequency space. And I can come back to that if there's interest in some later lectures, but uh, not. I hadn't planned to do so. Any case, so yes, it makes sense to talk about orthogonal windows and uh, uh, in, 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 in many different applications. And uh, even though you might think of a window function necessarily as something positive. Okay, so we have this this way of, of uh, looking at, at uh, so what we have is that uh, the integral of f t nu squared dt d nu over r2 is the integral we had of our original function uh, up to 2 pi. 1 over 2 pi. And so this is a, a, a special case uh, of, of what is sometimes called squared degrable representations of a group. Because what I have here is the inner product of f with my shifted and, and translated window. And if I, let's introduce an operator that does exactly that. I have here g s minus t e to the, the way I've defined it, I should write e to the i nu s. And if I like, write as an inner product, I really should have uh, uh, written a conjugation there, but my windows typically are real. So let me, uh, strictly speaking, I would have to write this here which would have made it this and that. This and that, and now I'm being exactly correct, even if windows were complex. But so then I'm allowed to write it here as this operator acting on my window and that inner product in L2R. So I'm, 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 I'm started with one function f, and I'm taking inner products of f with the orbit of a, uh, a, a group acting on w, a group representation. So let me introduce those operators. So we have introduced these operators t nu and they actually form a representation of the Weil Heisenberg group. So let me uh, uh, in, in the remaining time, 
uh, explain what I, I'm, I'm saying here. Again, this will be a building block that we will be using in, in, in future lectures. So let's look at what a sequence of such applying two operators does to a function. I mean, if we use the definition, then we get, uh, sorry, we use the definition and we get this function in the argument minus t1, sorry, don't know what I'm doing, uh, e to the i nu1 uh, s, and then I have to work this out, and I get g of s minus t1 minus t2, uh, e to the i nu2, and then this argument, s minus t1, e to the i nu1 s. And you see that I'm shifting here by t1 plus t2. And in frequency, I have a nu1 s and a nu2 s and a nu1 s. So I have exactly what I would obtain if I applied this operator to g in s, except I have an extra phase factor e to the minus i nu2 t1. And in fact, and for my purposes, it will be useful to change things slightly to make this a little bit, I mean, to make, I, I want to, I like to make that formula a little bit more symmetric. Um, and so I'll write here and minus i nu t over 2. What that means is that I don't have exactly uh, this anymore. If I insist on writing my windowed Fourier transform, so I would have to write that this is e to the i nu t2, that. But I still have, I mean, in this formula here, I still have that this is exactly the same as 1 over 2 pi r2 <coughs> the absolute values of these things squared because the only thing I've done is a phase factor. So to be consistent here I would have to be introducing those phase factors as well everywhere. So here, okay, I have worked out a WT1, so since that contains that phase factor, I have to write this phase factor now here. Then, when I work out this here, I have to add also a phase factor for that. So I get here minus i over 2 nu 1 t1 minus i over 2 nu 2 t2. And now I have to <coughs> be a little bit more careful about. So let's, let's write out all those extra phase factors because I have a minus i over 2 nu 1 t1 minus i over 2 nu 2 t2 and then now that I have taken this together to write a w I am missing the phase factor so I have to write also an i over 2 nu 1 plus nu 2 t1 plus t2. And now you'll see why I said this whole thing introduced symmetry. Because if I work all this out, I mean, so let's work out all these phase factors. So I get exponential. And then I have i over 2. The nu 1 t1 drops out. The nu 2 t2 drops out. I have a nu 1 t2 here. And then I have another cross product, a nu2 t1, 
with a half, but I have subtracted one, so there remains another half. And so what I found is that uh, uh, W T1 nu 1 times W T2 nu 2 is equal to this phase factor times W of T1 plus T2 nu 1 plus nu 2. So I don't quite have a representation of the group because I have this extra phase factor. Now you can, what you can do is you can uh, uh, extend the notion of, of uh, representation from unitary representation to a projective unitary representation or I can just make my group a little bigger and let's, let's do it that way. Let's think of, uh, let's think of, of group elements as t and nu both in R and z uh, element of the complex numbers uh, with norm with magnitude one, the one-dimensional torus. And let's now define a group law. to be the following. I add the times, I add the frequencies, and I take here uh, a z1 z2 e to the i over 2 uh, nu 1 t2 minus nu 2 t1. And let's now think of u, z, t, nu, acting on a function. So this is a group law on, uh, well, on the collection of, of, of these objects. And you can easily check, I mean, that there's a unit element, which is 1, 0, 0, that you have inverses and so on. So it's a nice group and it is uh, 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 the Heisenberg group. I mean, what you have is this, this, this kind of, of, of uh, phase, this phase factor in, incorporates this, the, 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 well, <laughs> it's not an accident that it has the same name as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, because in fact, in, 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 this is the way in which you, translations in phase space get represented into translations in the Hilbert space H2, uh, H, which is L2R, mm. that represents quantum mechanics. And it's this phase factor that, that causes uh, the non-commuting of translations in time and frequency, in time and moment, in position and momentum that, 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 is, that gives rise to the uncertainty principle. Okay, so if I define this, to be uh, z times w t nu f, then and I probably need to put a minus flat time, but we'll check here for a we'll check uh, because I, I I always have to figure it out. Uh, u z one t one nu one, u z two t two nu two is then oops z1 z2 u uh, w t1 nu1 
W T2 nu 2 and this gives rise to that and so I did need to put in the minus factor here because then you find that indeed when you work it all out that this is the u of z1 t1 nu1 composed with z2 to t2 nu2 with the group law that we have acting on f. Uh, so no f here. Because you get a phase factor from this and that phase factor no, you don't need that, sorry. So you have a unitary representation in L2 of R of this group, which is the weil hasenberg group. And of course, in... in what, and what we have is, so, when you have a group with a group law and you have a unitary representation from G into the unitary operators, so uh, into the bounded operators on H, but in fact unitary, so the subset of, of bounded operators that are unitary, and you have uh, that F uh, ug h squared and I integrate I mean uh, this is a, a, a group on which the left and the right har measure are the same and so I integrate over that har measure and what I get here is that up to a constant I get that this is f squared in H. Uh, 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 no. no. So in fact I have this. Uh, and and if H is one, then this disappears. So this is called a square integrable uh, a group representation. Uh, there exists a very nice theory for these. It can be extended to a theory in which you don't have left and right invariant measures the same. And what happens then is that you may have to, you don't get a, a multiple of the identity operator here, you might get the uh, multiple of, of another op self adjoint operator. But um, but so that's what we find here, and uh, ah, I have three boards here. I'm going to use this magic stick. So what I have is that uh, I have found that I have this unitarity. I mean, that the fact that this operator is, uh, well, sorry, let's, let's backtrack. I have found these operators, T nu, they're unitary. When I write, they are an example of this situation the group that I have had three parameters, had this z as well as the uh, uh, t and nu. But of course the integral over z is trivial since z is just a multiplication factor. And you could view that integral as actually contributing that factor to pi. So you can make it very nice and, 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 and elegant. I mean, uh, uh, but it's much more convenient, I mean in practice, to forget about z and to just uh, uh, look at this and we have t nu on some window 
uh, well, let's, let's, since I have here, it's a W, sorry. Thank you. So I have this. Since I have unitarity, it means that, I mean, and I could have used the same computation to justify this, or I can just obtain it by polarization out of the preserved norm. But if I now write... Ton micro est un peu décalé, tu tout d'un coup. Uh, so I could have, I could redo that whole computation, but I can also think of the fact that I have a, uh, 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 that this is really the inner product of, two w, of TW with itself. And up to, well, I had a 1 over 2 pi here, which I had forgotten, 1 over 2 pi. And this is f and f. And then because you can always represent inner products as linear combinations of appropriately chosen uh, uh, norm squared of f plus g and f minus g and f plus i g and so on, uh, you automatically inherit that equality for non-diagonal things. So uh, I also have that this is equal to the inner product of f and g. Okay, so here I have a window. If I write that all out, Then I just get here F, G. So this is sometimes called the resolution of the identity. Because here I could just think this is an identity operator. So what I'm saying is that if I write, and I, I think of this now as a, this, this, I have these rank one projection operators on scaled versions, scaled and translated, not scaled, translated and modulated versions of my window. And I, each of these is a rank one projection operator. I mean, this is a rank one projection operator. And here I look at diagonal elements of this rank one. And if I integrate over the group, uh, 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 group variable, I find that this gives me the identity operator. So the interpretation of this formula is that I'm looking at something that localizes each one of these localizes nicely the original function on a particular place in time and frequency. And of course, uh, uh, governed by the window that I picked, a different window will give me a different projection. And together, they give me little pieces of my function, which when I add them, give the original function. So if I think of it this way, If I think of this integral on the left being defined weakly, namely by how it interacts on functions, I, I have this. I have a way of reconstructing functions by taking things that are very well localized, and it tells me what I have to can put in front in order to... Uh... Now, I can put many other things in front here. In fact, we've already seen ways of in which we change that. If we have here a window and I take another window here, a W twiddle, that's orthogonal to my window W, 
I will have a different coefficient function here and will still give the same function. So there's zillions of functions I can put there. But this is a very convenient one and it turns out it's the one that has the smallest L2 norm in the full space, in the full double variable space. Okay, so recapitulating uh, because I'm going to close here for today and we'll resume next week, Monday morning. What have we seen? We have seen, I have, Monday morning. Yes, so, so next week, Monday, we'll have morning and afternoon and then the week after we'll have also mon morning and afternoon. And, and uh, maybe I'll, uh, and that should conclude the course, and maybe I'll, I'll try to, 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 to cram a little bit more in those lectures then, so that we make up for the, what we missed yesterday. Um, a couple, after I finish this, this summing up, I'll make a few announcements because... Uh, um, so, what have we done? We have motivated the idea that we want to look at either discrete or continuously indexed uh, windowed Fourier transform to localize in time and in frequency. We have seen that there was no orthonormal basis if we did it with localizing in time and localizing in frequency via complex exponentials. I have mentioned in passing that you could get around that and that's something that was only realized in the 90s, although it could have been realized many times, before, uh, a long time before, and it was inspired by computations of Will, by Wilson, that uh, you can get around this, this, this no-go theorem by taking, looking at sines and cosines, but we'll revisit that. We have seen that if you take it continuously indexed, you actually have this very nice way of mapping L2 of R in L2 of the index space, the T and nu space. And you map on a subspace, but you can map on different subspaces there. And you pack them very nicely in that space. And then we have uh, seen that norm-preserving map. We have diff a different interpretation of it. I mean, it's still the same thing, but we have this different interpretation as a superposition of projection operators, of rank one projection operators, that gives you the whole function again. One thing that we will do with this uh, uh, next time is we'll wonder what happens if you integrate over less than R2. You're not going to have the identity operator, but I will argue that you can localize that way. You can find nice localization operators and actually some of those will turn out to be very useful. Okay, that's it then for today. <laughs>